Good morning from Luxor. Today we won't be driving, but we'll take about a two-kilometer walk to the famous ancient settlement of Der El Medina. Let's explore unique, incredibly beautiful, more than three and a half thousand years old tombs, and much, much more. Let's go! The inhabitants of Der Al Medina were responsible for the decoration and construction of all those amazing tombs we've already seen and are still ahead of us. Walking towards the site, we are passing by one of the latest discoveries from April 2021. Archaeologists were looking for a mortuary temple of Tutankhamun, but instead they found one of the largest preserved ancient Egyptian settlements. According to the hieroglyphs found on the site, the city was called Tanaten, the dazzling Aten. It's actually not so spectacular as I thought it would be. The name The Golden City was created by its discoverer, Zahi Hawass, who explained that the city dates to the reign of Amenhotep III, the era known as the Golden Age of Egypt, hence the name. Smart move, Mr. Hawass. Today's exploration begins at the pyramids in Luxor. Perhaps not as spectacular as those in Giza, but they in fact had the same purpose. They were parts of the workers' tombs, which presumably were erected during their free time. The intact mortuary complex consisted of a small pylon leading to a courtyard with a chapel featuring a statue of the deceased, over which a brick pyramid would have been erected. The pyramid would feature a niche with a stele inscribed with solar hymns. The chapel led to the shaft, and then a vestibule connected with usually beautifully adorned burial chamber. Let's get inside! The first tomb, TT3, belongs to Pashadu and his family. He probably worked as a stonemason under Seti I or during the early years of Ramesses II. Okay. Pashadu was promoted to the position of the foreman of the left side, as the royal tombs were built simultaneously on both sides by two teams, left and right. The burial chamber, on its rear wall, Osiris, god of the underworld. Decorations in the tomb might be characterized as simple but charming. Like goddess Nut emerging from the sycamore tree, symbol of refuge, pouring the holy water of a kneeling Pashadu. Above the entrance, a boat with Ptah Sokar Osiris, manifestation of rebirth, in the form of a falcon, worshipped by the deceased. Another delightful scene, Pashadu, his wife Nejem Behdet, and their daughter or granddaughter fulfilling their religious obligation, a pilgrimage to Abydos, religious center of Osiris. The 
the most famous scene in the tomb, the deceased under the date palm drinking the water from a holy pond, which according to the Book of the Dead will save him from the fires of the underworld. Deir al Medina is located only one kilometer southeast from the Valley of the Queens and a few kilometers southwest from the Valley of the Kings. Founded in the 16th century BCE during the 18th dynasty by Amenhotep I, Deir al Medina was basically a planned settlement named by the administration Set Mad, the place of truth, housing royal tomb masons and craftsmen who themselves called it Pa Demi, the village. According to the officials, they were servants in the place of truth, whose main characteristics were discretion regarding tomb content and location and creativity coming directly from the gods. The next burial is called the family tomb as it consists of three burial chambers belonging to the father Amen Nacht TT218 and to sons Elder Nebermat TT219 and younger Kemteri TT220. All of them were servants in the place of truth during the reign of Ramesses the Great. The antechamber as well as the first burial chamber belongs to Amenakt. I'm not sure if you can see it, but the workers' tombs are tiny and very low, so sitting down to admire them is the best idea. Their size and depth do not facilitate filming or breathing. Amenakt's burial features another famous painting, Anubis standing before the embalmed deceased. Anubis, as a divine embalmer, was believed to have been the creator of the mummification process, enabling mortals to continue their life beyond. Hence, the priest supervising mummification, this enormously significant process for the ancient Egyptians, would wear masks of Anubis to embody his divine presence. The rows of hieroglyphs behind Anubis are fragments from the Book of the Dead. However, one of the most venerated deities in Deir al Medina was a local goddess, Meratsegar, a cobra headed woman or female headed scorpion or snake. She personified Theban necropolis, hence her epithets she who loves silence or beloved of him who makes silence, where he is Osiris, the god of the underworld. She functioned as a protectress of the tombs and their creators, but also as a fearful punisher of wrongdoers. All inhabitants of Deir al Medina feared her, knowing that if they desecrated or profaned the tomb, mainly through theft or breaking the oath of secrecy, they would be blinded by her or poisoned with lethal bite. But quite unique as for the ancient Egyptian theology, Meratsaga was a merciful deity, willing to forgive those who truly regretted their sins, and she was able to heal their physical punishment. According to the stele of one of the artists, Neferabu, Meratsaga healed his blindness. The site of Deir el Medina features the largest quantity of monochrome tombs in the entire Egypt. The TT219 of Nebenmat, we're now in, as well as unfortunately heavily destroyed TT220, just next to it, are some of the best examples. In short, monochrome means that the tomb's walls were decorated with a very reduced use of colors. Here, yellow figures, black and red details and outlines on the white background.
This black, rather puzzling silhouette is the shadow of the deceased, known as Shut or Suyet, believed to have been part of the person it was one of the components of the soul. It symbolized rebirth, reappearing after night, and protection. It was kind of a backup of the soul's Ba, which could have been killed during the journey to the afterlife. It's still unresolved how and why the monochromatic style evolved. Let's hear some hypotheses. The first one lists the religious significance of gold as the main reason. Its protective powers were highly demanded, but the material wasn't accessible to everyone. Even though our workers belonged to the middle or upper middle class, they had to find a different solution, hence a large amount of yellow, symbolizing sacred gold. The second theory focuses on the availability of minerals used as paint pigments – yellow, white, red and black – were locally produced and not expensive. On the other hand, blue and green not only needed to be transported from far away mines of Sinai, but also required complicated preparation. Moreover, during the Ramasid period, the demand for materials needed to build tombs including pigments, was enormous. So it was not just about cost, which definitely was insurmountable for many, but also about availability. Walking out of the tomb we can take a closer look at the beautiful decorations of the polychrome antechamber. Apart from Osiris, two primeval female deities of rebirth are presented. Nut, goddess of the sky in a quite rare form of hands and life-giving breasts in front of the Tiban mountain, holding a sun disk, which she releases every morning. And no, not Hathor, but Mehet Veret, goddess of the sky and flowing water, responsible for annual Nile flooding and sun rays for the crops. She was believed to have been mother of Ra, hence the sun disk between her horns, protected by and close to her. The next tomb, Titi I of Senegem, presumably a mason whose name can be translated to gentle brother, was discovered in the 19th century, completely intact, containing over 20 burials, at least three generations of the family, dating back most probably to the 11th year of Ramesses the Great Rhine, it contained funerary objects and furniture, which today are to be found on a display in museums in Egypt and New York. The main chamber is a little more than 5 meters long, 2.6 meters wide and at its highest point 2.4 meters high. The entire space of about 40 square meters is covered with funerary and mythological scenes. There's a theory claiming that the tomb was ornamented by the same artists who worked in Queen Nefertari's tomb. 
Perhaps it's a little bit far-fetched, but I think you'll agree with me that the quality of decoration is unbelievably precise and exquisite. I'd like us to immerse ourselves for a moment in the beauty of this place. Here are the owners, Senegem and his wife, Ineferti, worshipping the gods of the afterlife. At Der Ol Medina, around 50 tombs have been discovered so far, but according to the written records, the site originally featured more than 100 burials. It, however, isn't surprising given the fact that at its heyday, during the 19th and 20th dynasty, Der Ol Medina contained more than 70 houses with about 400 inhabitants. What really distinguishes this particular village is the abundance of information that has survived to our times covering almost 400 year time span, 15th to 11th century BCE. We have an insight into nearly every aspect of these men's lives, thus part of the history and culture of the New Kingdom. typical house in Der El Medina measured around 70 square meters, was 3 to 5 meters tall and had an easily accessible roof terrace. The door lintel was adorned with owners' titles and names. The interior was usually divided into four or five chambers, the reception room with an altar, the main room with a column in its center as well as false doors and niches for religious practices, then a bedroom with adjacent workroom and a kitchen. Below the bedroom was a small storeroom for food and drink. The walled settlement, laid out in a rectangular grid pattern, had only one main road, probably sheltered, running the length of the village. All houses were made of mud bricks on stone foundations and were painted white. The furniture was usually chairs, stools, low tables and small dressers. Most of the things, like clothes or tools of daily use, were kept in baskets. Even though the workers were quite well paid, this isolated village in the middle of the desert, without an immediate water supply, doesn't appear to be a pleasant place to live. Virtually everything – water, food supply, stalls, etc. – had to be transported from the East Bank. In circa 1156 BCE, during the reign of Ramesses III, monthly supplies, which were in fact workers' payment, were significantly delayed. The condition of the state wasn't good, war with the sea peoples and corruption among clergy led to the economic crisis. The pharaoh lost control over the state finances. The first ever recorded strike in history broke in Der el Medina. Craftsmen threw down their tools and marched on Thebes. They finally got paid, but Mat, the sacred concept of balance and harmony, was violated and Pharaoh's reputation tarnished. In front of us a mud brick wall of a much later Ptolemic temple dedicated to Hathor. Its construction was commissioned by Ptolemy IV Philopator in the 3rd century BCE. 
It's actually one of the best preserved Ptolemaic temples, built on a rather simple plan – a hypostyle hall with two columns, a vestibule, a birthhouse and three chapels – it was converted into a monastery by Copts during the Christian era, hence the modern name of the site – Der Medina, Monastery of the City. The temple embraces much older New Kingdom shrines and temples, which didn't stand the test of time, in contrast to multiple records describing even the smallest details of villagers' everyday life. A great part of the community could read and write. Men's occupation was hereditary. They worked eight to ten days shifts, sleeping in camps, and returned home for two days weekends, during which, if they didn't build the tombs for themselves or practice some other unofficial job, they spent on drinking, doing sports or hunting. They had the right to take additional days off in case of, let's call it, emergency. There's written evidence of absences justified by arguments with the wife, brewing a beer or a hangover. Women, on the other hand, took care of the village. They had servants sent from the state helping with grinding grains and laundry. Women baked bread and looked after the offspring, a typical pair had six to seven children. Some of the females held the title of Chantress or Singer, like Chantress of Amun or Chantress of Hathor, which meant they occupied high positions in local temples and shrines. Each woman had property rights, she could have and manage her own belongings and she as well had the right to one-third of marital wealth in case of death of her husband, but also in the event of divorce. But every community has its bad guys. In Der al Medina, a man named Panev was definitely one of them. Known in the village for robbing the tombs and adultery, he was eventually brought to trial. A part of the accusation reads Panev slept with the lady Tui when she was the wife of the workman Kenna. He slept with the lady Hel when she was with Pendua. He slept with the lady Hel when she was with Hesse Sunebev. And when he had slept with her, he slept with Webket, her daughter. Moreover, Apekti, his son, also slept with Webket. We sadly don't know what happened to this ancient playboy. The situation of Der al Medina mirrored the condition of the Egyptian state. When the power of the pharaoh weakened, so did the administration. Delays in payments became more frequent and for long periods there were no assignments for fear of the enemy. Workers either left the village or turned thieves. In circa 1069 BCE, the settlement was completely abandoned to be occupied by Coptic monks more than 1500 years later. Thank you 
for watching. To stay tuned, please tap the subscribe button and help my channel grow by commenting and sharing my content with your friends. this episode you will also like my playlist from Greece and Turkey. You will find the links down below. And see you on another ancient site!